Father, thank you, Jesus. Tonight again, we want to thank you for the joy of fellowship, for the privilege of knowing you, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, and having you as our Heavenly Father. Receive our thanks in the name of Jesus. Thank you again for the joy of the opening of this glory dome, which was done a few days ago. Thank you for visiting us with your presence here. And thank you for the days that have come after the dome in your presence in this great gathering. And all of your servants you've been using ever since this convention commenced, even tonight, we give you glory and praise in Jesus' precious name. Send to us your word again tonight. Let each person's life here be imparted. Let each person here return from here fully transformed. Thank you for definite encounters tonight. To you be glory forever. Let the sick here be healed tonight. Let the afflicted be set free. Let the hopeless be given new hope. Let every downcast be taken up. Above all, let your name be glorified. And all the saints of God in the house, raise your hand and shout the biggest amen. Please give your hand and take your seat, please. Am I sure that that hand is for Jesus? If it is, make it bigger, make it stronger. In this very great assembly tonight, I want to count it a great honor to be asked to share God's word at this newly dedicated, beautiful glory dome. I want to specifically again congratulate God's servant, the apostle over this commission, and his very dear wife, Pastor Paul, and Pastor Mrs. Anenche would like to rejoice with you again. It's never too much. My heart is filled with joy all of the time. Thinking about the great work that God is doing in this place. On the behalf of so many people, beginning with our spiritual father, Bishop David Oedepo, and his wife, and my dear wife, and our entire families, would like to rejoice with you again. And we thank God for your lives. As it has been declared, this is just one of the beginnings. Because greater things are on the way coming. To him be the glory forever. I deeply appreciate this honor of asking me to come to speak and share God's word in this convention. And it's my prayer that everyone under the sound of my voice and perhaps those watching by any technological means will be blessed in Jesus' name. I thought somebody said a very loud amen tonight. Let me also quickly comment on the consistency of commitment that has been demonstrated ever since our meeting with Pastor Paul and his wife. That dates back to quite some years now. The consistency, the commitment has not dropped. And I feel so excited that what began small has become a bit big and is going to continue to grow bigger until Jesus comes. The true test of a man is 
at the stage of his smallness. Many of us, if you allow me to say, can let you know tonight that you didn't know Pastor Paul because you got to know him when the ministry has become where it is today. And if I may say this or validate this by my little experience, when I was growing up, by God's grace, I was privileged to start pastoring a church of four people, including myself. My message that day was, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because I needed the Lord to shepherd me myself that day. <laughs> and from four we grew to seven, and from seven we grew to 12, and from 12 to 18, and from 18 to 13, we were never reducing, we were ever growing. Because I wasn't counting the growth by number, I was counting the growth by God's faithfulness. And then we grew to 30, to 34, and to 60. I remember one of those days we dedicated our first musical instrument, very powerful instrument, a tambourine. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it was an exciting day. Man, I called seven of our church leaders and I told them one after the other to thank God for the wonderful instrument, not despising the days of little things. Now, a few years after, somebody who was a church member when we were 60, incidentally, I met his son here um, a few weeks ago when we came for Pastor Paul's birthday. He introduced himself to me. I was a part of his father. So he came and met me when I was pastoring a church of 6,000 people. And he said to me, Pastor, you have not changed. I said, what do you mean? He said, the same excitement when you are 60 is the same excitement when you are pastor in a church of 6,000. Why have I said this? I've said this to make a point about my knowledge of Pastor Paul and his wife, particularly for the consistency of fervency of dedication, of dynamism, of love for God. The zeal of the kingdom has not shifted. This man of God is not acting the way he is now because of pastoring a large church. It has been the same when the church was few. By God's grace, I was privileged by invitation to be in that church when it was a small one. And gradually, gradually, as it is today. What lesson are we to learn from this? Be faithful in whatever God has put in your hand. Be faithful. There is nothing too small. You don't pray to grow big, you manage to grow big. You don't pray to grow big. As far as Jesus is concerned, his definition of bigness is faithfulness. As far as Jesus is concerned, if you are faithful in a few, you are already considered to be faithful in a big thing. Not that he will give you a big thing. For being faithful in small, he has already qualified you for the big. That's why for me, I don't pray for big things. I only manage small things faithfully. Pastor in a church of seven people, faithfully. In my little pastorate, nobody ever passed through me without feeling being pastored. If you leave me, you miss me. <laughs> By reason of pastoring. And that's what we should do. Business people. You are handling 500,000 for your business. Be faithful as if you are handling 500 million. Pastors who are here tonight, 
don't look at the attendance of the church with a eye of despise. Some years back, I asked a pastor to do a statistics of our growth for us, and he wrote in a note, he said, last month, we, in, we had a slight increase of 13 people. I called him, I said, you want to lose your job? God went into 13 houses and brought 13 additional people to church, and you only slight increase? Don't slight God if you don't want him to slight you. Don't ask what is this if you don't want it to remain as it is. God gave the children of Israel bread. He said, I will rain down for you bread. What did he say? We'll give to them bread. He opened a new kitchen, new ovens. And every morning was giving them a fresh oven baked bread. And when they saw it, you know what they said? Manna. Manna means, what is this? And God answered them, that is it. So for 40 years, the menu was not changed. They were eating the same thing every day for 40 years. There was no change in the menu. Don't ask God, what is this? Otherwise, it will remain as it is. Get back home tonight, somebody. Dance in your room and parlor. Enter your jalopica. Get excited inside it. That's how we danced our way from the little where we were. As Dunamis International Gospel Center, from small place to a big place today, and from this big place to a bigger place, and from this bigger place to another bigger place. Give God a big hand, somebody! Come up either is the theme of this convention. And the focus is on shifting higher in the supernatural. Higher. In this kingdom, there is no limit to growth. We only know where we start from. There is no limit to where we can reach. Interestingly, in this journey, overtaking is allowed. The first shall be the last and the least shall, shall, last shall be the first. In this journey, there is no seniority of status. There may be seniority of office for the purpose of organization, but for aspiration, there is no seniority. There is no bar. Nobody can limit you. Somebody is shifting ground. I know that that person is here. Very soon, those who knew you to be on the floor will find you at a higher level. Those who never thought you were meant to nothing will see you climbing higher. Those who call you this little brother will soon find you to become an apostle. Well, we all know that the journey begins at new birth. Once you are born again, you are registered into the school of signs and wonders. This sign shall follow them that believe. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. These signs shall follow them, not one person. And nobody's name or title is put there. Scripture is an open letter to all believers. Anything you find can be appropriated to yourself. When next you are reading scriptures, don't look at your neighbor to appropriate it to him, but to yourself. The copy of the Bible you have in your hand is a personal letter to you from God. These signs, not one. You are the one to determine the number. These signs shall follow. 
What is following you? Shame and reproach. What is following you? Say it confidently. Your neighbor may not like it. Say it right now. What shall follow you? When you wake up in the morning, enter into your car, you are going to walk, drive into your village, what's following you? Inside an aircraft. This sign shall follow them that believe. So all believers are signs commanders. So from new birth, God intends for you to live the supernatural. When you are born biologically, you are natural. But when you gave your life to Jesus, we call it new birth. There is biological birth and there is spiritual birth. There is terrestrial and there is celestial birth. There is a heartly life and there is eternal life. But when you give your life to Jesus, the journey into the supernatural commences. But we have to go. That's what it means to shift higher in the supernatural. Of course, The Holy Spirit is the fountain of the supernatural life. The Word of God is the food for the supernatural. Thank you, sir. Okay, let me go. Yes. I'm learning something new here. Praise the Lord. I say, Praise the Lord. What the Word of God is or rather what food is to the physical body is what the word of God is to the supernatural. You don't feel growth. You feed growth. Now I need to say this because a lot of believers want to base their spirituality on feelings. On feelings. When a child is born into a family, he doesn't feel like a member of that family. He knows he's a member of that family. How? By knowledge. How do you know you have physical strength? Not by gauging the stomach you put in your food. But you know it because your body is answering strength. The more we feed in God's word, the stronger we become. The people who do know their God shall be what? Strong. Simple equation. You don't feel strong. You just become strong. The people that do know. What you know is what makes you strong. The people that do know. So you know to grow. But tonight I want to quickly share with us something very crucial that will help us to carry the consciousness of the supernatural at all times. And that is divine presence. Divine presence is the backbone of the supernatural. Divine presence is the backbone of the supernatural. And I discovered from scriptures every operator of the supernatural both in the Old and the New Testament had one very strong desire and one assurance and that is the presence of God. The presence of God. And if there's one prayer I want to pray for you tonight is that the presence of God will be with you. 
Earlier, we have been told by God's servant, Pastor Paul, that the gift of life is not monetary or material. You see, many people look for different things. Often when we pray for people to prosper, you hear their prayer, their amen extremely loud. Pray for new houses, pray for miracle marriage. The, the loud, the shout is loud. But there are vital things that you need to know you need more than any other thing, among which is divine presence. If you can, please stretch your hands here. I decree that from tonight, the presence of God will go with you. Let's begin with Moses. You need divine presence more than any other thing. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus chapter 4, verse 12, and you know why Moses would need this prayer, this assurance. The Lord said unto him, Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what thou shalt say. I am with your mouth. Now this was a stammerer. His stammering was a major concern to him. Now, let me quickly bring to your notice, I personally believe that Moses was not a born stammerer. And I'll tell you why. A stammerer can never become a commander in the army. One of the requirements for becoming a commander is your voice. If a commander is a stammerer, he will confuse the parade. Stand at, 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 somebody has put his foot on ground, somebody is hanging. So the parade will be lost. Amen. <laughs> Do I have some generals here tonight? Now they will testify to what I'm talking about. You confuse the parade, you confuse the troop if you're a stammerer. And Moses was a commander. How did Moses become a stammerer? By my personal revelation. Moses became a commander or a stammerer when there were no more human beings to command. He suffered mental demoralization. Somebody who was commanding human beings is now commanding cattle. Crack, 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 crack. <laughs> That's my personal revelation anyway. <laughs> he was sent out of Egypt with nothing but a rod in his hand. Of course, it was a wise choice he made. So when the Lord came to Moses and said, Moses, I want to send you, I could picture in his mind saying, Oh Lord, I wish you spoke to me 40 years ago when I had a clear voice to command. And God said, I don't need your tongue now. And there is no indication that the Lord healed Moses of his tamarind, of his tamarind. What you don't have, God does not need. That's why up till today, up till today, ask anyone that God called, he will tell you why God should not call him by reason of what he does not have. Everyone that called God called today gave an excuse based on what they don't have. And God will answer them, I don't need that thing, so I will not give it to you. But I will give to you what you don't think you need, which you need. And this is divine presence. Once you secure divine presence, the journey is a sale true already. And so, when it came to time for Moses to pray, in Exodus chapter 33, verses 14 and 15, he had the conversation between him and God. God said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give you rest. From today, you shall have rest. Let me hear somebody say amen. 
in your home, in your career, in everything you do, you will have rest. And the following verse, Moses protested, if your presence will not go with me, don't take me from here. And I think that is a prayer we should all pray. You should protest before the Lord. If you will not go with me, leave me here. The presence of the Lord makes all the difference. Now, come to David. What distinguished David was divine presence. He was disqualified at all levels. First of all, when a king was to be elected in the house of his father, Jesse, Nobody took cognizance of him. His name was not registered. He was not nominated. He was not considered fit at all. After all the sons of Jesse passed through, out of frustration, Samuel asked, are these the only sons you have? And Jesse said, oh, I remember there's one boy in the bush, but I'm not sure you will need him. His father didn't consider him. And Samuel said, no, we will not take our seat until he comes. And while he was coming, I guess that Samuel was looking at him with one prophetic eye. And the Lord did not allow Samuel to speak. He said, hey, this is he. Stand up, anoint him. He got to the field to take food to his brethren. And the brethren looked down at him and said, what are you looking for here? We know your pride. Get back home. Somehow, he managed to get to the palace. And the king told him, you are not able to fight. And he got, by some means, to face Goliath. And Goliath said, look at, look at this skeleton. I will finish you today. So at different levels he was despised. But look at what made the difference in the life of David. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of hell and anointed him in the midst of his brother, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. And verse 18, further explanation. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning in plain, and a mighty valiant man. Mighty valiant man. What a good qualification. A man of war. Another qualification. A prudent man in matters. And a comely person, handsome, good looking. But above all, the Lord is with him. That is the highest qualification which you look for in life. That the Lord is with you. Your grammar may be good or not, may not be good. But let the Lord be with you. Your dress may look good or may not look good, but let the Lord be with you. Your credential may be wonderful or not, but let the Lord be with you. That is the greatest need of any believer. And the Lord is with him. And the Lord is with him. Again, I pray for each person here tonight may the presence of God go with you. And so, having lived with King Saul, David knew the woe of losing the presence of God. So in Psalm 51 verse 11, after David had some issues, he prayed, Cast me not away from your presence. Cast me not away from your presence. If the Lord throws you out of his presence, you are finished. May the Lord not cast you away from his presence. I thought somebody saying a loud amen to that. Now, let's come to Jesus.
three different times there was a testimony of divine presence with Jesus. First, by an unbeliever. Two, by his closest disciple, Peter. And three, by himself. He had an insider's testimony, he had an outsider's testimony, and he had a personal testimony. Nicodemus, chapter 3. You are looking at me? Where do you find Nicodemus? Okay, find it now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Nicodemus, chapter 3. Okay, John, chapter 3. Let me help somebody here. John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Let me submit here tonight. The miracles we see in this church is not because our pastor is an apostle or an evangelist. Don't make that mistake. The signs and wonders we see in this church is described in that verse. No man can do these things except God is with him. I have discovered several times when you think as a pastor you have made a lot of impact after the service. Nobody came to, see, to say to you, Pastor, I thank God for the message today. But the day when you felt you messed up, you didn't perform, people lined up and said, Pastor, I want to thank God. I've never had that word the way I had it before. <laughs> How? Because God was with you. The other day that they didn't greet you, it was your message. You preach your message. Is somebody here with me? And I think when Paul realized this, he said, well, I will rejoice and take glory in my infirmity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know the way God operates? Until you are down to nothing, it doesn't make you to come up to something. The best time to enjoy God is when you look like down to nothing. Because at that time, it becomes clear to you that this is the finger of God. No man can do these things except the Lord be with him. Now, an insider's testimony. Acts chapter 10 verse 38. Peter, having watched Jesus closely said, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why and how? For God was with him. The most important thing is that last phrase. For God was with him. May God be with you. If you got a new job or got promotion, it is not because of your qualification. Because there are people who are far better than you. It is because God is with you. You know what David said? He said, among all of my father's children, God chose me because he liked me. God was with him. I want you to take your best testimony as the testimony of divine presence. Divine presence. Now, let's hear Jesus' testimony himself. John chapter 8, verse 29. 
He that sent me is with me, with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He is with me. He is with me. My Father is with me. Things are happening because my Father is present. Carriers of his presence are natural commanders of his power. Carriers of his presence are natural commanders of his power. Why am I bringing to us this message tonight? It is so that we can grow in divine presence. Grow. Grow God around you. Grow God inside you. If I have one hour to pray, I will pray 90 minutes for his presence and perhaps maximum 10 minutes for his power. The last promise Jesus gave to us is not promise of power, but the promise of his presence. And lo, I am with you. Always. I am with you. I am with you. Now, something runs through your system. If you ever hear God say to you, I am with you. I don't know about you, but he sends signals to me. Every time I am reminded of his presence, it gives me unique strength. That I wake up desiring every day. That I go about with every day. And every one of us can enjoy his presence. As I mentioned earlier, you don't have to feel it. Just know it. Many years back, when I wasn't as knowledgeable as I am right now in the spirit, I was taking a flight from Kano to Meduguri in those days. And as I took my seat, an air host came and met me. He said, sir, can I know you? I said, what about that? He said, when you enter, something entered. I said, I'm not surprised. Something always enter when I enter. When I go out, something goes. <laughs> Man, I, I, I enjoy divine presence all the time. Divine presence. Divine presence. It subdues opposition. It intimidates your enemies. When I'm told, when I'm told somebody doesn't like me, I say, let's go. Let's go and meet the person who doesn't like me. And as we approach, I hear the person say, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. I, I, I thought you said they don't like me. <laughs> divine presence. Divine pre From today, divine presence will subdue your enemies. <laughs> now, if you watch the story of David, he never met the king before. But at the first appearance, the king loved him. He was captivated by the king. He sent to his father, he said, hey, your son David will not go back. He will be here with me because I love him. And immediately, David became the armor bearer of the king without training. Divine presence. The first time he met with Jonathan, Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Divine presence. Now, that is not, it's not an ordinary thing. This is a palace boy, Jonathan. This is a farmer's boy, David. No meeting point. But divine presence melted them together. Now, how, how I wish many pastors will realize this. They think that what makes impact is their preaching. You may be the best preachers. If people don't like you, there's nothing you can do. I have taken time to study pastors, especially churches that are growing. And I discovered that most of the pastors are on a zooming. They don't look like it. Yet you cannot deny it. They don't look like it. Either by eloquence like myself, or by appearance like Pastor Paul. Amen. <laughs> I don't know his weight, but uh, I think I'm heavier than you a little bit. 
Yet when he speaks, all the demons are trembling. When he prays, the sick getting healed. The afflicted are getting delivered. Why? Divine presence. Pastors, when next you finish making your notes, when next you carry your Bible and carry your handkerchief, as you are going to the altar, be praying, Father, let your presence go with me. Your presence, your presence, your presence. That's what makes the difference. You may be very eloquent in preaching, but if the presence of God is not with you, you'll be messed up. Divine presence. When you are going for your next interview, of course, carry your certificate, carry all your credentials, but don't forget to carry the presence of God with you. From today, the presence of the Lord will go with you. I'm not sure I had your amen very well. Let me quickly highlight here before I show to you how to command divine presence very briefly. Divine presence is superior to the anointing. Anointing is a thing, a thing, a virtue, a substance, measurable, accessible, usable, exhaustible. But divine presence is a growing relationship. Now, in Peter's testimony of Jesus, hear what he said. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. Anointing is for function. Divine presence is for relationship. Anointing can be exhausted. Most of us, especially preachers, will know what I'm talking about. There are times the oil goes low. But when the oil goes low, divine presence will make up. Don't value anointing more than divine presence. Samson did. He lost his two eyes for it. He was banking on the anointing until he lost divine presence. He was such a man. In Judges chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold a young lion roared against him. And suddenly the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord here means the anointing, the power. And he rent him as he would rent the kid and had nothing in his hand. Nothing in his hand. At another time, chapter 15, verses 14 to 16. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And in response, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cuts that were upon his hands became as flax that was burnt with fire. And his bands loosed off from him. And he found a new job on an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men there with one man, slew one thousand people at a blow with fresh jawbone of an ass. Not dry bone, fresh, slippery. How did he manage to grip it? The anointing. But this same Samson was banking on the anointing rather than building up relationship with God. If God be for us, you need God to be with you more than the anointing to be on you. Anything can run down the anointing, but nobody can separate you from God. That's what Paul said. If God be for us, who can be against us? Therefore, what shall we say to these things? What shall separate us from the love of God? What shall separate us from relationship from God? What shall separate us from divine presence? 
If you note, let me quickly get you back to this. If you note the prayer of Moses, please go and study it. There was no time Moses prayed for power. He prayed for divine presence. He prayed for God's glory. He prayed to know God. Now, getting back to something. He was trading the anointing until one day, Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Judges 16, 20. And she said, the Philistines be upon the Samson. <laughs> and he woke up out of his sleep, like before. And he said, I will go out as other times before. Yes, I'm under the anointing. And he shook himself. See, that's what the anointing do. The anointing makes you have feelings. Shook himself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. Once you lose divine presence, you become a toy in the hand of the devil. That's why the greatest attack of the devil on you is not on your anointing, but on your relationship with God. He knows if you lose the anointing, you can go back for the anointing. But he knows if you lose the relationship, you are finished. May the presence of the Lord not depart from you. Oh, I want to hear your roaring amen, somebody. Now, another quick example. King Saul. Many of us know the story in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Saul was anointed. Became a, he came into the class of the prophets. But Samuel told him in chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. And Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal. To renew the kingdom. To renew the relationship. Verse 15. And all the people went to Gilgal. Before the Lord. And they did all of that. For renewal. Until that time came. Saul didn't go for renewal again. He became a big man. First Samuel chapter 15 verse 17. Samuel speaking to Saul. He said when you were little in your own sight. Was thou not made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord was with you and anointed thee to be king over Israel. But now you are a big man. You see, sometimes the anointing can make you feel like a big man. Big man heading for destruction. It got to a time, Samson didn't feel he needed anybody again. His mother spoke to him with a wave of hand. Cry them off. Nobody could speak to him again. The anointing can make you look like a big man. But divine presence will make you remain small in your eyes. And if you watch Jesus, that was his way of life. Jesus will keep making reference to the Father. I can of myself do nothing as I hear, so I speak. And his brethren will come to him and say, hey, why don't you go to show yourself at the priest, at the, at the feast? And Jesus will say, excuse me one minute, father, should I go? And the father said, don't go. Stay here. And he will stay there until the presence of God says, go. And whenever he went as the, as the divine presence leads him, open doors. Great things happening with ease. Now, quickly, as I round up, how do you secure divine presence all of the time? Jesus gave us the formula, John 8, 29. Very simple, and then we break it down. And he that sent me is with me. May God be with you. You know, you can be sent by God and God is not with you. 
It's you that will invite him to be with you as you are going. He is giving us the promise he will be with us. But out of your self-will, you can go without him like Paul the Apostle. Paul said, hey, I feel bound in my spirit that I should not go. But I have to go. I count my life as nothing. I have to go. And once he went, Paul that was being celebrated as a God became a toy. Divine presence will make people celebrate you as God. Outside of his presence, you become a toy. Paul that demons will see and begin to scream. Now they arrested him, scrape his head. Where was the anointing? Where were they scraping his head? The anointing has left. The anointing is of no essence when divine presence is absent. Of course, the anointing may work for a while as residue. But his presence is what will never leave you. My father is with me. He that sent me has not left me. Look at the, what Jesus said again, John 8, 29. He said, because I do always. Say with me, I do always. If you want him always, what do you do? Do always those things that please him. Quickly, I want to show to us the things that pleases God in the school of the supernatural in signs and wonders. Number one, maintain a quality walk with God as a lifestyle. A quality covenant walk with God as a lifestyle. Many, especially preachers, focuses a lot on their work. W O R K for God than their work with God. I would rather not walk for God. I would prefer to walk with God. Now, God called us first into relationship before calling us into service. Relationship before service. And Enoch walk with God. When I caught that revelation in 1991, driving from Kaduna to Makodi, it has stayed with me. And Enoch walked with God. Nobody may ever testify of your work for God, but let God testify of your work with him. In all probability, when your walk with God is great, the overflow of it becomes the works among men. That's why Jesus will spend much time with God in prayer, in fellowship, than with men. He will stay all night, early in the morning. What gave value to the work of Jesus at daytime was his walk with God at night time. He will come out, people will touch the hem of his garment and be healed. His walk with God, reflecting in his walk for God. The reason why we are not carrying sufficiently the power of God is because we are not carrying the presence of God. You cannot carry his presence and not flow with his power. It's a sequential order. Carry his presence and you will naturally manifest his power. On the mountain, Moses wasn't praying with power. He was praying for the glory. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show me your face. And by the time he came out, 
the Bible says they looked at his face and they couldn't look directly into his eyes. The power was manifesting. You cannot carry his presence and miss his power. You cannot carry his presence and miss his power. In between services, many years back, I just took a walk out of, after the Safos service, and as I was going to the vestry, a young lady was following after me. I didn't know. And I turned, I said, can I, can I help you? He said, no, I got what I'm looking for. Because according to him, the spirit said, walk in the steps. She was walking in my step. What was the problem? She had had weak low for nine years on the finger. Growing fungi. After that walk, the presence of God I carry dropped the power of God for somebody to catch. You cannot carry his presence and miss his power. Business people carry his presence. Instead of carrying complimentary card all around town. Carry his presence. You are due for some job they say they won't give you. Leave them alone first. Go and build up divine presence. By the time you appear again, everybody will be saying yes sir to you. Yes sir. Yes sir. They will be calling you, begging you to take what belongs to you. See, if you carry God, you don't beg men. Don't beg men. I see many pastors going from place to place looking for who will support them financially. It's because you don't carry God. Carry enough of God. People will favor you. Jesus didn't beg for anything, yet he never lacked anything. Divine presence was too much. Jesus said, I need a place to keep my disciples. Say, why not? It's free of charge. Carry his presence. In the first church, they were not begging for anything. The apostles were so blessed, their hands were so full that they were dropping things at their feet. Get his presence and you will not miss his power. Get his presence and you will not miss his power. Get his presence and you will not miss his power. Somebody say amen to that. <laughs> Develop a daily walk with God. A day you don't start with God. It's already a lost day. I don't care who gave you an appointment at 5 a.m. When you should be meeting with God. Develop a closer walk with God. That's number one way to please him. Number two, live in obedience as a lifestyle. Obedience. Jesus said, I do always the things that pleased him. Jesus lived in obedience. Philippians chapter 2 from verses 5 all the way to 7. He lived in obedience. Obedience even to the point of death. Live in obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verses 1 to 13. It's a clear scripture on obedience. John chapter 14 verses 21 and 23. John 14, 21 and 23. He that hath my commandment and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and my father and I will manifest to him. We will be living with him. We will be living with him. We will be with him. And he will be with us. Number three. Keep praising God as a lifestyle. Be a praiser of God. Psalm 34 verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 22 verse 3, God inhabits the praises of his people. So every time you are praising God, you are building an habitation for God. Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. Praising God is building an habitation for God. Then sang Moses the children of the, and, and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider, at he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my son, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. Praising God is preparing an habitation for God. 
praisers of God are carriers of God. Hallelujah. That's something I cannot miss. Praise God always to carry God always. Psalm 114 verses 1 to 9. As they thought that they were praising, mountains saw them and skipped the hills, began to tremble before them because of praise. Number four, way to secure his presence is humility before God as a lifestyle. Humility. Humility. What is humility in this wise? Humility is considering yourself small and making God big. John 3.30 He must increase but I must decrease. Decrease yourself for God to increase himself. Make yourself of no, zero reputation. The greatest hindrance to God is you, not the devil. The greatest hindrance to the devil is me. Make yourself of no importance. Now, one thing that is killing people in this world today is a feeling of importance. Self-consciousness. See, there's a difference between self-awareness and self-consciousness. Self-awareness is about the discovery of you in God. But self-consciousness is a discovery of you in you. What Satan tells you that you are. And that's why you see people today carry themselves big everywhere they go to. They get angry. I went to that place, they didn't recognize me. What recognition do you need? Ask yourself now, what recognition do you need? You are bothering yourself too much. Jesus made himself of zero reputation. If they greet you, they feel like greeting you. If they don't greet you, they don't feel like greeting you. What can you do against that? He made himself of zero reputation to a point that he was thrown naked in the open. That is the highest order of shamefulness. They took him to the open and made him naked. All the Photoshop you see that the body of Jesus, the private body of Jesus was covered. It was not so. He was stripped completely naked in the open. He made himself of no reputation. You know the undoing of Saul? He wanted recognition before the elders of the people. He got it but lost God. Why was David forgiven? Even though his own sin looked worse than that of Saul. In the open, he confessed. Forgive me, O Lord. And he wrote Psalm 51. The prophet said, you are wrong. He said, yes, sir, I know I'm wrong. When the prophet told Samuel, I mean, told Saul, you are wrong. He said, no, how can I be wrong? It's the people. It's the people. It's the people. Ask the people, not me. He loved reputation. He lost divine presence. Lovers of reputation always lose divine presence. May you not lose divine presence. <laughs> Number five, and I close with that. Walk in holiness as a lifestyle. Walk in holiness. Our world is becoming so much sin, fullness inclined that is becoming difficult to draw a line between what is right and what is wrong. Compromise everywhere today. Even in the church. People don't call lie, lie again. They call it, what they call it? Slip of tongue. Somebody committed adultery. And they say it's because his wife is not around. Or they say it's his weakness. His weakness. When they should slap him, remove his teeth from his mouth. <laughs> now, this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. I give you two examples from scriptures. When the children of Israel crossed Jericho, they were to capture a little town called Ahai. 
God told them, don't touch anything in that city. Destroy everybody, everything. And one man called Achan went and took the Babylonish dress. And you know what God did? In Joshua chapter 7, the Lord said, I will not return to the camp until you take away the abomination. Simple. Verse 11 and verse 12. Joshua fell on his face and the Lord said, stand up. Israel has sinned. They have taken the accosting. For they have taken the accosting and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now from verse 11, he said, I will not return to the camp until they take away the accosting. I will not return. I think that's in verse 12. I will not return. Now the church of Jesus today is suffering in silence and unfortunately we are smiling. We don't see the power the way we used to see it before because from priesthood to membership, we are touching accursed things. And God said, I will not return until they take away the accosting. I will not return. You can't touch sin and expect God to remain. That's why David prayed. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Take away sin from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Take away the throne, but give me back your presence. We need to get back and no assumption. This I do on, on regular basis. I pray for cleansing from sin. You know the Bible says we should pray, we should cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. There are things that wants to hold to you. You have to clean yourself every day. Go about, you see billboard with dirty things. Go about on television, even on your personal telephone, you open it, some strange things are appearing. You need to pray to sanctify yourself every day against the pollutions of this world. And preachers, please help our church. Help our church. Help our church. You know somebody is living in sin because he gave you one million naira, you pocket it and you are praying on tall tongues over his life. I've told God, I would rather go to my village and pastor 30 people than be a pastor of 30,000 people who are not living right. I would rather leave ministry than compromise. I want divine presence. God, if you like, take me from ministry, but don't take me from your presence. Don't take me from your presence. This is important. Holiness must be restored back to the church. Righteousness must be restored back to the church. Let's call it the raw name. You see, if you don't name sin, you cannot tame sin. Name it to tame it. Name it to tame it. Let pastors stop exaggerating on the altar. Now, in Numbers chapter 23, a second example. Please bear with me a little time. Balaam went and hired Balak to curse. I mean, Balak went and hired Balaam to curse God's people. They were uncursable. And you know the reason why? From verse 19, chapter 23, verse 19. Because there was no iniquity in them. God is not the man that should lie. Neither son of man that should repent. As he said, he will not do it. As he spoken, will not make it good. Verse 30, 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he had blessed, and no... No, I cannot reverse it. Now, look at this, very important. For he had not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither had he since perverseness in Israel. Therefore, the Lord is God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. But in chapter 25, when they became uncursable, Satan went and flooded their camp with evil people. Verses 1 and 2. And Israel abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And verse 2. 
and they called the people unto sacrifice unto their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And what was the outcome? Verse 3. And Israel joined themselves to Balpoa, and the anger of the Lord came to against him. Now, in chapter 3, it was Satan that wanted to destroy them. In chapter 25, it was God who destroyed them. Touch sin, provoke his anger. Live in holiness, attract his presence. Because our God operates in the beauty of holiness. Do you want his presence to go with you? Please walk by these five things among several others. My God will be with you. I didn't hear you loud, amen. If you got blessed by enemies, please help me give Jesus a big hand. He's worthy.